Alrighty, so this is a presentation, uh, Maritime Safety, and it's going to focus on uh, the shores of Benzie County on Lake Michigan, um, mainly just showcasing what our museum has as far as images and other stuff that helps tell the story. So we're going to move right along. So why build a lighthouse in Benzie County? Um, and this is a map uh, that was drawn by uh, the government in 1867. And the blue dotted line shows the line between the Manitous and Leelanau. And then uh, further down actually shows some of the routes um, to Manitowoc, Sheboygan, Milwaukee, and Chicago. And um, this was a busy point, not just in 1880 where they said that four fifths of all traffic passes near Point Betsy, but uh, even in the 1840s, anything from Detroit, Cleveland, Buffalo, going to Chicago would pass through here. And uh, they traveled a little bit differently than in manner, mannerisms. They would follow the shore. This is an example uh, from a coast pilot uh, that tells how to get from the north of Leelanau down to uh, Platte River Point. And, uh, and with all the telling where you can lay up and where you can be along the shore and be safe, particularly during the storm, you'll, there's other examples from these coast pilot books uh, that talk about the various installations uh, that the government put in. So this map is showing the route that most of the travel took, the green dotted line. Uh, going east and west through Chicago. And then the, the big blue arrows uh, talk about the wind. And if you're following the coast and the wind blows you eastward, you're gonna get a little close to the shore. And this is an example of uh, what would happen. Uh, this is from 1893. Uh, these schooners are caught up on the sandy shores of Michigan. And uh, it shows that the uh, even later in years, in 1893, that can happen. And even through the 1930s, uh, boats that would try to take refuge between, behind the Manitou Islands and everything like that, or behind Platte Point, they would still get stuck. So to help keep people aware of where they were along the coast, uh, the Point Betsy Lighthouse was built in 1858. It is the oldest standing structure in Benzie County, and uh, they do a nice job out there, and it is a very nice rock beach. <laughs> we don't have a lot of early photos of Point Betsy. Most of our photos for, are from 1900 and there on, um, but uh, we have a lot that are associated with the Life Saving Service that I think really add to uh, their story. Um, the Friends of the Point Betsy Lighthouse and the National Lakeshore do a really good job telling the story of the maritime uh, on this part of Lake Michigan. And, and we just like to supplement them whenever we can with our pictures and stories. So this is uh, from 1865. Uh, this is another Coast Pilot book. It's talking about the Point Betsy Light. Um, and then it talks about Betsy River and Frankfurt. and. Uh, the harbor of Betsy River was the name before Frankfurt was given to it. Uh, it says 10 feet of water, and uh, that's really uh, at the best time it had 10 feet of water because uh, the land holding company, the Frankfurt Land Holding Company, uh, was trying to improve the harbor so that they could sell some property further inland on the Betsy River. And this is a lithograph from a map that was drawn in 1860. Uh, and it shows two piers that are going through the original mouth of the Betsy River, uh, which is kind of where the cannon is now, so if you're aware of what's in Frankfurt. Um, so through the parking lot for the Frankfurt Beach. And since this is a slow moving river, the Betsy River, it kind of would get mucked up. And uh, and originally it was even built with uh, hand tools and wheelbarrows. Um, so there really was lacking as far as being, letting some of the larger uh, boats into the harbor. 
Uh, if you look to the right of the piers, you see a little treed mound, and that is where uh, Father Marquette was buried, allegedly, and then later transferred to St. Ignace. This man here is uh, Dr. Alonzo Slyfield. He was the second light keeper at Point Betsy. Uh, we know a lot about him because his son, Charles Slyfield, wrote an account uh, about his time at the Point Betsy Light and also at Frankfurt. And there were some of the earlier people here. And uh, Dr. Slyfield had some interesting stories of not just being a light keeper, but he would also apply his trade as a doctor going as far as Lake Ann to uh, take care of some uh, some illness there. So uh, he wore many hats. It's another photo, probably a little bit after 1900. Um, I like the number of people you can see uh, on the glass on the lighthouse and also uh, at the front of the house itself. This is a little bit later. Uh, you can see that there are more buildings around. Uh, you can see the outhouse, which is very important. And uh, they also uh, have the building for the foghorn. And uh, this is a later colored image. And you can really see on the left the notice that the, there's a wooden thing along the shore, and that was improved upon later on when they added a, a metal revetment, which you can see here. Um, so um, the development of Frankfurt was really reliant upon the government developing the harbor and uh, the investors that tried to uh, build that first channel. They uh, later lobbied to be called a harbor of refuge along Lake Michigan shore. And that really gave them access to the investment that was needed. So they got the memorials from Congress, which uh, then allowed them to get the funds. And then Hubble and Whitwood out of Saginaw and Detroit brought their steam dredge and um, their others their stone and everything. And here you can see the steam dredge. Uh, you can also see the dune in the background. And uh, this was quite a, this caused quite a commotion when it arrived. A lot of people haven't seen a piece of machinery this large or effective. Here they are filling the cribs with rock by hand, all those men, <laughs> that's the labor. <laughs> And this is a government map from 1871. Uh, and it shows that they cut the channel on the south side of where Father Marquette was. So the, the, where it currently is the channel. And then it had just had two piers. And later that would be improved on with the breakwater, but that's, oh, about 70 years from this here. And they even included the show where the old channel was, if you look a little further up on the map above the piers. Another neat thing on this map is that the Corps of Engineers really liked calling Betsy Lake, all Betsy Lake, and they were pretty consistent with that. And, uh, and also, if you look in the lower right, you can see that they included the ironworks on that map and uh, in the pier associated with it. So this is the first light that was on those piers. Uh, this is a later rendition that has the fog well. Originally, it just had the light, and it is a wooden structure, and it had the wooden elevated walkway going along the pier. Later on, they added the fog bell. That helps me date this to 1880. Uh, and the light here, it was... It used liquid fuel, and that's important uh, for something that goes on a little later in its history. This is another pilot book, um, and uh, a center part is something that I like. This is from 1880, and it says, uh, Mariners all declare that Frankfurt is the best harbor or refuge on that part of the coast. Between it and Point Betsy, you can still in smooth water when a storm is raging 
from the north or around to the northeast. So the Life Saving Service opened a station at Point Betsy, and that was in 1877. Now, a lot of this information I got on Point Betsy, I get from John Hawley. Uh, he wrote a book titled Point Betsy, and he also is one of our upcoming uh, speakers for this lecture series. He has a new book out called Guardians of the Manitou Passage, and I'm sure it's just as detailed as this Point Betsy book. I like this image of Point Betsy because you can see the lighthouse and you can see the yard in which the men are working in. Um, they're sawing their own wood, which is more work than I would want to do with it. And uh, you can see that they're utilizing the edgings as well. Uh, there's also a dog laying down on the sand, which I think is important. Here's another image, and uh, this has their lifeboat there, and you can also see uh, their life car, uh, which is elevated and to the right of the opening. Um, the designs of the buildings at Point Betsy and Frankfurt are different. Um, the ones at Point Betsy are more ornate, and that's sometimes that's the only way I can tell where the picture was taken there, and always as nicely stamped as this image. There's another image further south. You can still see the light and you can see all the brush that surrounds it. And uh, there's still a lot of brush around that there. Uh, the people that worked there, they called it White City. And it was referenced that if you look in the newspaper archive, they'll have uh, little news updates from a neighborhood and this neighborhood was called White City. Uh, it wasn't a, you know, it was kind of isolated uh, because there wasn't a really good road going from Point Betsy to M22 um and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later <clears throat> this image is nice because you can actually see the men and you can see the numbers on their sleeves denoting which position they take in the crew and that helped denote which job they would do as well It's another good image of a crew. Uh, so when these guys worked for the life saving service, it wasn't a year round occupation. So they'd have to find another job and work at that and also leave like a point of contact so that they could be contacted if they were needed. Uh, we have a book that was put together by the museum called Daylight in the Swamp. And uh, Roy Oliver uh, has an interview in that. So not only did he work in the woods, but he also worked with the Life Saving Service and a passenger boat at the time. So he really has some interesting insights into the life of be being a person working in the service. Uh, these are not men, these are ladies. And they are dressed up in their husband's uniforms and they're trying to get votes for women. And I assume the kid is helping. Point Betsy. I like this image uh, because one is just a very nice picture of a lifeboat, but also hey, uh, Chuck, I got it. It shows that uh, they have fruit in there, and that so their job wasn't just to preserve life along uh, along the shore. Uh, they're also up to yeah. salvaging the images right uh, now. They're showing a, a life saving boat. So, so salvaging yeah. cargo from the boats yeah. that had been wrecked. They also were known to uh, get boats off when they were caught on the sand and they would 
throw boxes of flour or cans of food. And then um, that would get lightened the boat enough to get off and go along its way. But uh, that also helped a lot of local families that would pick up uh, the groceries off of the beach. This is a nice angle that just shows you the size of uh, the yard that they had at Point Betsy. I like this photo because not for the trees, which are important, uh, but also that it says the U.S. Coast Guard and uh, the Life Saving Service combined with the Revenue Cutter Service in 1915 and became the U.S. Coast Guard. Also, if you look at the top of the building, uh, there are people in the window. A lot of these images have people standing on various parts of the building. And so it's kind of like a Where's Waldo kind of deal. Um, one of the better stories from the history of uh, Benzie County is the sinking of the J.H. Hartzell. Uh, the Hartzell was an ore boat that brought iron ore from the UP to the iron works in Frankfurt. One time uh, they, Hartzell got here early and they didn't get, they needed assistance to get through the channel into Frankfurt Harbor and they were waiting outside of the piers. Well, during that time period, a storm came up and they were caught on the on one of the sandy sandbars out there. And so they called the life saving service to come assist. Uh, but at this time, this is 1881, uh, that, uh, correction, 1880 in October, the nearest life-saving service thing was at Point Betsy. So they had to walk eight miles um, down M22 uh, to just south of what is now Alberta. Um, problem is, is at that time, there wasn't a road f from Point Betsy to M22, the state road. So they had to blaze their own path and then they had to walk all the way down uh, this road, which had M22 had a lot more turns than it has now, and it is not as flat, and it was probably sandy. And then once they got over the bridge at the Betsy River, they traveled south to what is now the extension of Grace Road, and they got off at Grace Road Beach, and then the Hartzell was just north of that point, uh, but there wasn't really an access Went, so they had to go down a sand dune. Um, that was quite an ordeal. And the people of Frankfurt were trying to assist. They provided horses and communication. And even on the beach, they spelled out messages on the dune so that the people on the Hartzell could see uh, what was going on. And this drawing was done by a member of the Life Saving Service, an officer, and uh, it shows uh, the predicament that the boat was in. And uh, this rendition is, uh, this account is put in the, the annual report by the Life Saving Service. They would um, talk about the various experiences and how they were effective. And, uh, and this was included in the 1881 report. Um, 
It was a good experience, except for there was one lady, Lydia Dale, who was a cook who was ill at this time, and she uh, was not rescued using the life car. Um, all the men got off the boat before, but she was delirious and wasn't able to follow commands to get ashore, and she passed away. She perished and drowned, and uh, they found her a few weeks later on the beach. Um, the town wasn't very excited about this. They uh, thought that the lady should be rescued first, um, but uh, it seemed like a very difficult situation to make that determination if she was delirious. So, uh, and there was even a movie made about this a while back. Uh, and it's a, something to look at, if not just to see somebody that you might know. In they used local people for actors. So. This is an example uh, in some of the life-saving services uh, literature showing how um, a breaches buoy would be used. Um, and then um, a similar idea was used for the life car. You can see next to the lines, there are various numbers. And uh, if you remember the men who had numbers on their coats, those correlate to what job they would have in the situation depicted here. This is a much later image. This is from about 1906. And this is the Frankfurt Life Saving Station. Uh, they would do drills and they would drill for the people that were resorting in the area. Um, and you can see this is an example of how they would run that drill. This man is in the breaches buoy. If you see the crackling in the upper right corner, uh, that's because this is one of the glass plates that is held at the museum. And uh, some of them are in varying degrees of uh, condition. So, uh, but we did scan this so that we could put it away and keep it safe. This is another example. And you see the life car being used here. Uh, in the foreground, in the center, you can see a box with the time. That's uh, that's the faking box, so that they have the rope ready to go for whenever they need to uh, go into action. You can see all of the resorters watching, as long as the people along the walkway on the pier. And this is another image here. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of image, but it seems like the guys on the crew, the life-saving crew, like to put young women in the breeches buoy or the life car. So this is a drawing of the piers at Frankfurt. This is from 1882. This is just after uh, the Hartzell sinking. Um, and this shows uh, what a barrier it was to the life-saving crew. They couldn't just walk straight down the coast. They couldn't get their gear across this channel. And um, it is believed that this led to them establishing the life-saving station in Frankfurt. So this is a photo of the life saving service in Betsy Bay. This is an early photo, 1888. Um, It's a nice view of Frankfurt's downtown as well. Uh, if you see the steeple in the just right of the center of the, of the far shore, that's, uh, that's the Congregational Church, and that's on Fifth Street, and it is a great place to know, uh, a marker so that you know where you are on the downtown. Here's another image, and this is the building. Uh, that is still in what is now Alberta. It's in the park there, and they still have it open for uh, weddings and events. It's in a different location, though.
this image shows the life saving station in regards to the channel. And you can see a schooner being uh, towed into the harbor by a tug. Uh, this is another view, and you can, uh, if you look in front of the life saving station, this time the lumber mills were going, and uh, a lot of the um, various parts of logs would float all over the harbor, so they'd have to clear it out every now and then, particularly on the shore. You could see it on the shore. And so, um, There's another view. Uh, you can see with both doors open, you can see inside and see how they stored both uh, the, the live car, but they have a motor boat is a motorized boat there. And they also have a man on watch on a walkway on the roof. So this image is nice because it shows the life-saving station. It also shows on the right side, it shows that they have a wireless tower, um, which could either be a wireless beacon or a transmitter. And also they are doing a boat drill and they are doing it for the benefit of uh, the, the onlookers because they're wearing their dark swimsuits instead of their white uniforms. There's a picture of the men with their wives. So here's another boat drill and they're doing it for uh, entertainment purposes. Andy, someone would like to know what materials were in the early life vests. Um, if you know. It looks like here they're wearing cork life vests. Here's another boat drill image. And uh, if you look on the back right, you can see the life-saving station and you can see the man on watch. Below them, you can see the people observing the exercise. And on the left, uh, the building with all the pipes, that is the Grainville Elevator in Alberta. And at nine stories, it was the tallest building in Benzie County history, it still is. They're doing another boat drill here in front of the famous hotel, the Royal Frontenac Hotel. Built in 1902 and burned to the ground in 1912. Oh. So this is the Ann Arbor number three. Uh, 
the Ann Arbor Car Ferry Service started in 1892 and it ran through 1982. And uh, this image is here because it's going outward through the channel on its way to points westward. And uh, there was an incident in one of its departures from the harbor where it actually struck a rowboat where the assistant light keeper was crossing the channel uh, to fill the, the oil lamp uh, in the lighthouse on the south pier. And uh, this is one of the reasons the light was moved later on uh, to the north side of the pier. Most of the light keepers stayed in Frankfurt because there was a more rental housing there. So when the car ferries uh, started going in and out of Frankfurt, that really Im increased the, the amount of traffic that uh, Frankfurt Harbor was having through the channel. And another example, aside from the assistant light keeper's boat being hit by a car ferry, uh, there was a sinking of a Rhine, of the Rhine. Here it is right here. It was a fishing boat owned by John Hanrath. And in 1908, uh, it was struck and its wreckage came ashore and uh, the weather wasn't the best and they think uh, a car ferry hit it just based on the amount of damage to the boat. Um, one of the things that made this uh, tragedy even more a tragedy is so that two of the crewmen on the Rhine were members of the Frankfurt Life Saving Station. Uh, this incident happened in December, so they were in the off season. One of the nice things about Frankfurt being on Lake Michigan is that it has a lot of participation in some of the great stories that occurs. Uh, one of the characters that uh, people become enraptured with is Dan Seavey. He was known as the pirate of Lake Michigan or the Great Lakes. And uh, Frankfurt played a part in the story of him being called the pirate of the Great Lakes. Um, so Dan, who was known for many things. Uh, he was known for the taking of the Nellie Johnson and then selling it, it somewhere else on the Great Lakes. And then uh, he hid in Frankfurt Harbor. And this was only known to the government when they tried to obtain him is because they had all the life-saving stations being on the lookout for his, his boat. That's Dan Seavey on the left in the older picture. Dan Seavey has kind of attained the status of a folk hero, so um, some of the stories are larger than life. On the right is Dan Seavey's boat, The Wanderer, and it is a sailcraft, which was important in this situation. So he took his boat all the way down towards Alberta, where, uh, where the old marina is, where the, the bridge meets Alberta. And... Uh, and he was hiding there. And since there's a curve in the shore there, uh, most of the boats outside on Lake Michigan couldn't see him. Well, the, the life saving station uh, communicated with the revenue cutter Tuscarora, who was on its way to apprehend him. And they're like, well, let us know when he comes out. And uh, so, Dan, being a smart sailor, he got his speed up and he shot through the channel and then he was going north and then he was running away from the Tuscarora, which is a, a steamship. And then they fired a shot over a bow and he knew when he was licked. So in Platte Bay, he was apprehended. Um, he went to court and he got off, uh, which 
only increased uh, his status as a folk hero. This photo is taken in 1912, and this is, I can tell because there are two piers with two lighthouses on them. Uh, the, wooden, the wooden pier light on the left and the new steel pier light on the right, and they're replacing the elevated walkways. In 1915, the Coast Guard is created by combining the Life Saving Service and the Revenue Cutter Service. Uh, on the right of this image here, uh, this is in Frankfurt, uh, is the Bell Ferry that would go between the North Shore and South Shore on Lake Betsy. Here's a different image. Um, and I like this one because if you look on the far left, you can see the rail yard of the Ann Arbor Railroad extending into the beach um, because they needed more and more room to store uh, the cars before and after their trip across Lake Michigan. Nineteen twenty-three, the Ann Arbor num number four uh, left Frankfurt Harbor, met a storm, and then made their way back. And they were lucky to get inside the pier. They're right there next to the South Pier, and then number three is floating next door. Um, now uh, it was in the winter. It was in February, and uh, if you look. To the very left of the Ann Arbor number four, you can see what looks like a plat little platform gangway, but uh, it was a ladder, and that's how the crew got off the boat uh, after they came to rest. So in nineteen thirty-five. Uh, the life saving, the Coast Guard moved the life saving, well, you know what I mean. They went from the south side of the channel to the north side of the channel. The Coast Guard station at Point Buncey closed in 1937, and later the, the lighthouse went into the Coast Guards. Uh, so it's not just life saving stations and uh, Lighthouses. This is a nice photo. Um, this is not from the museum, but from uh, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the C. Patrick Labadee collection. And it shows light boats or light ships. And uh, they would uh, go to mark places when a lighthouse would need repair or was being refurbished or it was a place where lighthouse couldn't uh, operate very well. Um, and I particularly like this because uh, in the background is the Frontenac Hotel. And this is the south side of the building. And you can see the chimney and where the kitchen was for the hotel. So this is an Army Corps of Engineers boat. It's the General Gillespie, and it's a sand sucker. It's a dredge boat. And here it is going through the channel. Just behind the bow of the boat, you can see a long roof line, and that is the Frankfurt Ann Arbor Railroad Depot. Andy, can you go back to photos? Mary Link, um, you might have to speak up about what, is this the photo you're asking about, Mary? 
She's asking, what are those circular things on the top in the last photo? Is this the photo, Mary? The, the one that showed my, the um, kitchen of the uh, hotel. Okay. And so what are the- those things. Yeah, what are those? That, those were where the, they would light the gas for the lights. For what lights? They were they replaced the lighthouse, so they burned a light at the top of the mast. Oh, yeah. So those were attached to a boat, or were they on the yep, shore? Yep, there's two boats there, and there's four masts with the bulbs uh -huh. on. Them. Yeah. So what what fueled those lights? Um, I don't know specifically. I assume the same fuel that they used in the lighthouses. Huh. Thank you. Yep. There's also a man up there. So this tug is called the E.D. D. Holton, and uh, it is a tug that was in Frankfurt. And uh, the tugs were usually called to assist the life-saving service, particularly because uh, their boats initially didn't have motors. So the tugs would tow them out to a wreck, to a boat that needed assistance. and this tug is particularly important because it was owned by Charles Slyfield. He used it for fishing, but his uh, his father and brother were the light keepers at Point Betsy, and he also helped them with his boat on occasion. Now this is the lighthouse tender Yantic. And they would take supplies and fuel to the lighthouses along the coast. And this is an early photo, and it this is the Yantic. And you can see in the background on the left side, that is the Frankfurt Iron Works. And uh, on the right side, you see the two houses. That's the Blackhawk House and the Anderson House. So this is the Frankfurt Coast Guard Station. It's now the Oliver Art Center and they built a new building for the Coast Guard a little bit further west. So 1935, uh, the Corps of Engineers added a breakwater system in addition to the two piers around the channel. Um, and that's this is the configuration that we have today um, with the white steel lighthouse at the far end of the north breakwater. And then uh, we have the channel going through there. This is another photo from the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. This is a schooner called the Active, and it's on the shore of, well, Frankfurt's Beach, along with all of the people's stuff. So and this is what I have for the talk. I hope you enjoyed the photos, and I hope, if you missed anything, uh, we'll put this video online. And then uh, I think that's all I have. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Andy. Um, Elizabeth would like to know how many rail cars would be loaded on the boats to cross the lake. That is a tricky question because the the size of the boats and the size of rail cars changed over time, so I can't give you an easy answer on that one. How about a range? Like, can you give us a couple of examples of of boats and how many they might carry? I can't now, off the top of my head, no. Okay.
Now, Andy had mentioned John Holly's book, and I really want to recommend that book to you, um, Guardians of the Passage. Uh, we have it available for sale uh, through our museum bookstore. I don't think we have it online yet, but you can call the museum and um, order it. And I, John's still online. I think they're selling it still at the bookstore in Frankfurt. And if John wants to tell you where else it's being sold, he's welcome to do so. But I really, if you found this presentation interesting, this will take you um, very deep into the topic and it's, it's really well written. Yeah, I think John left the, the conversation. Are there any other questions that anybody has? Well, thank you. Oh, go ahead. I'm here. I, I'm here, actually. Oh. There we Hi, go. Jen. I've got both picture and voice now. Um, yeah, no, it is at the bookstore uh, in Frankfurt. And I much appreciate your referring to it. I look forward to also uh, speaking uh, later into the year for you all. And um, wonderful uh, job, Andy. And uh, I think uh, that you had some really interesting uh, pictures that uh, are going to be. Uh, really helpful and people understanding what's going on. I particularly like this last one with the folks, you know, setting off on the beach with all their stuff there. It's one I haven't seen before. But anyway, uh, yes, um, uh, the the book is at the Frankfurt Bookstore as well as uh, available online and through you all. So uh, we're well covered. So thank you. Great, John. We look forward to seeing you this summer. And as I mentioned, that next month on April 14th, we'll be uh, welcoming Jack Harnish, and he'll be talking about E. Stanley Jones and his friendship with Gandhi. Uh, and we have a great series of lectures coming up beyond that. I can find those on our website, and we'll be launching. We'll be uh, releasing our formal events uh, programs for the summer coming up here. Uh, but a couple of the highlights include a history of blacksmithing and a blacksmithing demonstration out in Glen Arbor. We'll be uh, guiding folks on a tour of the SS City of Milwaukee. Tim Foster will be leading that tour again this year as he did last year. And it was one of our most popular events. Uh, so you wanna check that one out as soon as we uh, offer the reservations up. Uh, Tim Foster will be leading a Frankfurt Historic uh, Neighborhood Stroll in September. And we'll also be offering some walkie tours of various communities. I'm especially excited. Uh, we'll part, be partnering with the Betsy Valley or um, uh, Betsy Shores District Library, and on three Tuesdays, Thursdays, we'll be offering a program at the library for children grades second through fifth, um, and they'll be learning about the history of the area. And that will be led by a high school student, uh, Rachel Kuiper, who's working with one of our educators in that program. And we're really excited to work with um, Betsy Shores. So um, any other questions before we sign off? Well, thank you for joining us. And if any of your friends are interested in seeing the presentation, we do have it on our website, uh, benzymuseum.org. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, everybody.